בשנה טובה. אבינו מלכנו, of course, is one of the essential prayers of our High Holy Day liturgy. The origin of this prayer can be traced to the great Rabbi Akiva, who lived during the second half of the first century and the first half of the second century. He is a larger-than-life figure, the focal point of both history and legend. Tractate Ta'anit of the Talmud records that there was once a drought in the land of Israel. Akiva's teacher, Rabbi Eliezer, prayed on behalf of the community. Before the open ark, he offered 24 blessings, but no rain fell. Then Rabbi Akiva took his place before the open ark, and he prayed not 24 blessings, but just two. He said, Avinu Malkenu, אין לנו מלך אלא אתה. Our Father, our King, we have no ruler but you. אבינו מלכנו, למענך רחם עלינו. Our Father, our King, for your sake, have mercy upon us. And the rains began to fall. The text explains that somehow God was moved by Akiva's humility before the open ark. And so we attempt to recreate the scene, to emulate Akiva's position before the Aron HaKodesh, and we also repeat his prayer language, Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King. Avinu Malkenu, our parent, our ruler. Avinu Malkenu, our source, our sovereign. Wrapped up in these two evocative names for God are two distinct relationships that one might have with God. Avino reflects the intimate loving relationship between parent and child. Malkenu reflects the stately and noble relationship between monarch and vassal, sovereign ruler and loyal servant. It seems that neither one of these names alone would have caused the rain to fall, but taken together, Avinu Malkenu, in perfect counterbalance to one another, a powerful chord is struck. When the congregation assumes Akiva's position each year standing tall before the opened ark, when we sing his words of Avinu Malkenu, God may be moved by these words, Avinu Malkenu, but are we? What makes this such a sincere and concentrated prayer like few others? Surely it is the melody that evokes an emotional response in us, but I believe we also respond to the repetition of this phrase, Avinu Malkenu, Avinu Malkenu, Avinu Malkenu. Consider each name alone. How is God for us like a parent? How is God for us like a monarch? How are we like God's children? And how are we like God's subjects? And consider them taken together as a unit, as two parts of one whole. To recite the words of Vinu Malkenu is to simultaneously claim God as the one who is close to us, who is compassionate and loving, and also the one who establishes a just rule for all the world, whose justice must ultimately reign. To put the two together is to invoke both God's imminence and God's transcendence in one prayer. Perhaps it is this combination of roles and relationships and responsibilities that makes Avinu Malkenu so compelling for us. And it's this combination of beliefs which are represented in mortar and bricks, or more accurately, I've been taught, in poured concrete, to form what is known as Holy Blossom Temple's tower. It's an unusual architectural feature, our tower is. 
Churches and mosques have distinct architectural forms, but synagogues do not. Wherever we have wandered, our houses of worship resemble our surroundings. A synagogue in Morocco looks like a mosque. A synagogue in Toronto, like ours, might, like, might look like Timothy Eaton Church. <laughs> Same architect. And so tomorrow, on Shabbat Shuvah, the Shabbat of returning, we will return to pride of place in our tower. It has been locked up for decades, used only as a geniza of sorts for boxes of old books and papers, including some of Rabbi Eisendrath and Rabbi Isserman's sermons. Only the bravest students would sneak up there over these years past to write their names on the walls and to catch a glimpse of the view from up above. Thanks to David Hertzman's generosity, the tower has been made safe again so that all can enjoy it as a place for retreat, contemplation, and wonderment. In anticipation of tomorrow's joyful dedication, I'd like to speak just a bit about two giants of faith. They could not have been more different one from the other. But each took inspiration from this tower. Each took inspiration from the God for which this tower stood in their eyes. And we, in turn, can take inspiration from these two models of faith. One would have called upon his God as Malkenu, and one would have called upon his God, I imagine, Avinu. Some congregants still hold in their own memories, memories of Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath. He was handsome and ambitious and so eloquent. Holy Blossom's pews were packed with Christians too who came to hear his sermon lectures that were known to go on for close to an hour. This one won't. <laughs> <clears throat> Rabbi Eisendrath was, of course, the spiritual leader who boldly led this congregation from downtown to 1950 Bathurst Street. He had the vision of this great edifice on top of a hill with a lighthouse to shine across the landscape of what was then the northern reach of this city. It is told, and I don't know if it's fact or legend, but it is told that the architectural plans caught the attention of a neighboring minister a respected colleague of Rabbi Eisendrath. The story goes that the minister asked that the design of the tower be reconsidered. Aware of the sensitivities of the day, Rabbi Eisendrath agreed to lower the tower by a few feet, but he insisted that it remain standing as the centerpiece of this Holy Blossom campus. In a dedication souvenir to commemorate the opening of this temple, in 1938, Rabbi Eisendrath spoke these words, a descriptive sketch. The tower was so important to him. He wrote, the imposing tower rises 82 feet from the ground, from which is afforded by virtue of the temple's lofty elevation, one of the most superb views of the entire city. It is hoped that the tower, looming so nobly above the city by day and illumined by night, either by softly colored floodlights or by a continuous flame arising from a brazier, symbolizing the ancient fire which was to be kept burning continually upon the altar of the Holy Temple at Jerusalem. This will thus serve as the central motif and the theme of this glorious structure itself, proclaiming in imperishable stone man's eternal aspiration toward the divine and the beckoning of the children of God to worship the Lord Malkenu in the, the beauty of holiness. Wow. <laughs> the royal abode was built for Melech Malchei Hamlachim, the ruler above and beyond all other rulers. One artist's early rendition of the tower depicts that streams of light would come out from the windows above. Eisendrath's vision, I imagine, was inspired by the biblical prophet Isaiah, about whom he so often preached. 
Holy Blossom Temple, in his vision, was to be a beacon for the city and beyond. It was to be an or lagoyim, a light unto the nations. Temple lore, and again, I don't know if it's rooted in fact, but temple lore has it that those tower lights were to be shut off during the war years for fear of raids, of air raids. And over the years, so I'm told, the lights were often shut to save on the electric bill. But today, those tower lights are being relit. Today, Holy Blossom Temple's lights are being rekindled, proclaiming humanity's eternal aspiration toward the divine. This may or may not be the language we speak today, but I know that many among us do share Eisendrath's vision of a synagogue as a leading institution in the city and beyond, that, that our aspirations must include a public agenda, that a congregation like ours has a responsibility to be a beacon of justice and a leading voice of religious courage, we are to respond to the call of Malkenu, a demanding God, who sends out royal decrees from on high. Our task then, in turn, is to ascend in noble responsibility. Rabbi Eisendrath was a tall, imposing figure. Eventually, he went on from this pulpit to serve as the president of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, he was the leading voice of North American Jewry for 30 years. And now our other model of faith. Jacob Hertzman was a very thin boy, born with multiple physical and developmental challenges. He spent his 15 years of life in and out of hospitals. Physically, he was a bright light a big toothy grin and a shock of platinum blonde hair, a big personality and he would dress to the nines. But his brightness came from a much deeper place within him. Jacob was a deeply religious person. I wish I had known him. Sometimes I feel that I do. Holy Blossom Temple played a very important role in his life. He knew from a young age that this was a special place intended for special purposes. Jacob's mother, Jill, would bring him on Shabbat morning to family services where he would sing his heart out in prayer. When he came for religious school, he would dress for the occasion in his signature blue blazer and red tie. And when he was lucky, he would notice from time to time that the door to the tower was unlocked. And Jacob and his father David would sneak up the narrow staircase to take in the tremendous views from the perch of windows up above. I infer that Jacob's personal theology was much more Avinu than Malkenu, much more loving parent, provider, protector than ruler. Jacob knew his God through intimate relationships with family and friends and teachers and nurses, and doctors. One Rosh Hashanah, Jacob was in the hospital and feeling unusually low. His parents decided to bring the holiday to him. There were apples and honey, cake, challah, and wine. Although he was in real pain, Jacob insisted that he put on his shirt and tie and navy blazer for Yom Tov. And one of his biggest fans, Rabbi Sharon Sobel, came for the occasion, and she brought with her a great big shofar. Jacob lit up. He called in all the nurses and doctors and therapists to huddle together in his room that Rosh Hashanah, and no one could deny his charms. That day, that Rosh Hashanah, Jacob was the Kohen Gadol, who convened the sacred ritual and transformed that hospital room into the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies. God's imminent presence was known there as it was known in the quiet corners of the tower. God's nearness was felt when Jacob would wrap his thin arms around those who he loved. Jacob's parents, grandparents, and teachers nurtured, nurtured this unusual spirit within him. 
His extended circle of family and friends were drawn to him in unrestricted love. For Jacob, God was more Avinu than Malkenu, more the nurturing source of comfort and compassion, which was always close by, never beyond his reach. And I know that many among us share Jacob's vision of a God and of a synagogue that is caring, that is all about trust and kindness. Jacob's congregation had aspirations that included building relationships that sustain and support, guide and mentor. He knew that a congregation like ours must shine as a beacon of faith in one another. Faith in one another. To respond to the whisper of Avinu, a nurturing God, urges us to make God's presence known in the world through intimate, trustworthy, I vow relationships. We take these two models of faith together. Rabbi Eisendrath and Jacob Hertzman. And we take their personal theologies and we weave them together in our prayers over and over again. Avinu Malkenu, Avinu Malkenu. One without the other is incomplete. To work only for public purposes is not enough. To work only for private moments of holy exchange is not enough. So let our aspirations be for both large and small, for the public and the personal. When we climb that tower, let us take steps with intention, climbing, ascending, and with each step saying, Avinu, Malkenu, Avinu, Malkenu. Let us transform ourselves to be like those angels in the biblical character, Jacob's dream. Those angels were ascending and descending in search of the sacred. And then we will open our eyes, as did the original Jacob, and we will behold this sacred place. And we will declare, as that first Jacob did, with renewed clarity and renewed strength and renewed purpose, Manorah hamakom hazeh. How awesome is this place. Ein ki im Beit Elohim. This is none other than the house of God. <laughs>